Hello, I'm Guillermo Montero Melis, a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics and at Stockholm University. The work presented here is done in collaboration with Tanita Dauke. Let me walk you through our study, what are the semantic dimensions of word meaning, moving beyond the Nijmegen method. How do words structure conceptual spaces? What semantic dimensions are encoded in words? Here we focus on human motion, but the approach is general. Imagine the space of all possible human motions. Points in this space correspond to specific instances of motion. We are interested in how humans make sense of that space. What are the main conceptual dimensions that we interpret as meaningful when perceiving human motion? To answer this, we look into the main dimensions encoded in motion verbs, as this should reveal important aspects of how we structure our experience. The Nijmegen method has been a popular approach to discover the underlying semantic dimensions of the lexicon. In this approach, researchers devise a set of visual stimuli and ask speakers to label these in order to figure out which dimensions are encoded in the words. If two video clips are always labeled with the same verb, then whatever differs between them is not a relevant dimension for the motion lexicon. Conversely, if another video clip is systematically labeled with a different verb, then we know that something linguistically relevant differs between it and the other two. For all its advantages, there are two serious problems to the Nijmegen method. First, how do we know that we are sampling the right regions of the space? After all, this space is infinitely large, and each video clip is just one tiny point in that vast space. We can easily miss out on regions that aren't covered by our lexicon. The second, more general issue is that words do not just denote individual instances of motion. Instead, words denote whole categories of actions. We can think of words as referring to whole regions in our conceptual space. Wouldn't it make sense then to get insights directly on the categories themselves? This is precisely what we do in the present approach. By starting from the other end, we sample from the lexical space. We take a comprehensive list of verbs that constitutes the lexical inventory to talk about motion. We then ask speakers to organize those words in their subjective conceptual space. We are thus directly probing their representation of the whole category of reference. Speakers' semantic similarity intuitions give us what they perceive to be the most salient dimensions in the lexical domain. Note that it is much more feasible to comprehensively sample the lexical space than the perceptual space because there is a limited number of words, whereas there are infinite actions to which they can refer. This was enough of an introduction. Let's move on to the actual step. How did we select the verbs? We looked for all verbs denoting human ways of moving from one place to another, on land, and without tools or vehicles. We tried to include all verbs that satisfied those criteria, but excluded verbs that were very infrequent or often unknown to adult native speakers. We can see the final list of 31 verbs and their approximate translation in the table. In the first experiment, we wanted to uncover the meaning dimensions that underlie the lexical domain as perceived by native speakers. In this task, participants arrange the motion verbs on the screen according to similarity by clicking and dragging them. The algorithm is adaptive and tries to reconstruct the participants' underlying multidimensional space by having them carry out successive two-dimensional arrangements with different subsets of the verbs. The results aggregated over all 42 participants can be visualized as a symmetric similarity matrix. Rows and columns represent each of the 31 motion verbs. Warmer colors mean more similar, yellow or white mean the verbs were perceived to be more different. This average matrix yields some clearly interpretable clusters and others that are more tenuous. We see a cluster of verbs denoting normal walking, one that corresponds to running motions, a broader cluster that seems to correspond to defect walking, within which we find two more specific clusters of slow walking because of tiredness or low motivation or because you're relaxed and motion that is out of balance. There is a small cluster of jumpy motions and one that corresponds to motion performed with the body close to the ground. Note, however, that some verbs seem not to cluster at all. Interestingly, a multidimensional scaling solution of the similarity data yields a first dimension that readily maps onto the speed of motion, while the second dimension is not easily interpretable, but seems to bear some relation to degree of control. In sum, we replicated previous findings of clear biomechanical clusters corresponding to running and walking. But we also found evidence for dimensions that have been dismissed as not central to the meaning of motion verbs, such as internal states of the agent, the function of motion, and speed. 
But are we perhaps projecting too much of our own research intuitions into these results? In our next experiment, we wanted to validate our interpretation of the previous results. We employed a task that was similar in nature, but at the same time more constrained and explicit. We used a category induction task in which participants group the verbs into discrete categories and provide a label for each of their categories. The average similarity matrix shows clearer clusters than in experiment one, which is not surprising because verbs were grouped into discrete categories. A nice feature of the task is that we can now interpret the clusters based on the labels provided by participants themselves. Importantly, the clusters that emerge from this task are very similar to those we found in the free arrangement task, confirming our previous interpretation. Despite the structure we see in the aggregate picture, we observed rather large variability between participants in both experiment one and two. The leave one subject out correlations shown here suggests that participants varied quite a lot with respect to the average picture. In our next experiment, we try to understand this variability better. So why do we find so much individual variability in how speakers judged verb similarity? We considered two scenarios. First, it could be that speakers just have inherently different semantic representations of the verbs. However, a second possibility is that speakers select different criteria to make their similarity judgments even though ultimately they think about these verbs in similar ways. The second scenario has a geometrical interpretation. Think about the verbs we saw before and the space they lived in. Perhaps that space is high dimensional, and depending on what subset of dimensions speakers focus on, they will order the same verbs differently. To tease apart these two possibilities, we devised what we call our projection task. The paradigm is identical to the one we employed in experiment one, a similarity arrangement task. However, now we ask each participant to organize the verbs according to three different criteria. The physical and visual similarity of motion, the internal state of the person moving, and the function or social context of the motion. We call these projections because participants have to project the verb semantics onto different subspaces. To answer our question, we computed how much participants resembled each other when they projected down the verbs to the same subspace. This is the between participant correlation on the left of the x-axis. And we compared this to how much each participant resembled him or herself across the different projections. What we see is that participants are more similar to other participants doing the same projections than they are to themselves. This supports the idea that speakers have shared high dimensional representations of verb semantics that they can judge along different sets of dimensions. We also found that of the three projections, it was the visual physical projection that resembled most the default arrangement of experiment one. This supports the idea that speakers spontaneously predominantly base their arrangements on visual features of motion. When comparing the three different projections among each other, we found that judgments of function and of internal state correlated very highly. To conclude, in this study, we have identified the main cognitive dimensions encoded in motion verbs. Physical or visual dimensions dominated, especially speed, but we also saw that internal states and functional dimensions played a significant role in the verb semantics. We saw that speakers judge verb semantics flexibly, they project meaning components onto lower dimensional subspaces, and they do so in a consistent manner across speakers. Our method is extensible to other domains and has less of a visual bias than the Nijmegen method. It is best seen as a complementary approach. We expect to also extend this approach cross-linguistically. Thank you for listening. If this was interesting to you, if your own work is related to this, or if you're just curious, please do get in touch. Bye-bye.